Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, it is afternoon, right? Yeah, okay. Who even knows? Um, I, I hope everybody's had a great con. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, I'm going to introduce myself and my fellow panelists, and then we will get started. My name is Nadia. Um, for those of you who have not been in the Electronic Frontiers Forum yet this weekend, um, I'm an activist with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and one of the things that I work on is uh, domestic surveillance, uh, NSA spying, and also spying by local law enforcement. Uh, and we can just start to my left. Blair, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, hi, my name is Blair Chantella. I'm an attorney. I practice law here in the Atlanta area and other parts of Georgia. Um, and I also focus on Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment issues, and NSA surveillance. My name is Amy Stepanovich. In fact, for those of you who've seen me already somewhere at the Electronic Frontiers Forum, my name is still Amy Stepanovich. Um, I am still U.S. Policy Manager, as far as I know, um, at Access Now working on um, privacy, free speech, um, other human rights from a technology angle, um, and how those intersect. Um, my name is Jeff Termeshazen. I've got, um, I'm a technical consultant with ACI Worldwide uh, Payments, and um, we get monitored a lot. <laughs> So I'm going to start off by just giving uh, the most brief background ever and then uh, just asking one question and then we'll just uh, go from there. So um, the, this is a pretty big topic to cover domestic surveillance and uh, backdoors. Um, so I'll just give a little bit of background uh, for folks who don't know. Um, the debate around backdoors has to do with uh, basically the government either requesting, strongly requesting, um, and mandating in some cases under uh, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, um, ways that law enforcement can access data. So uh, sometimes that has to do with uh, just basic access, and that's, that's more what CALEA has to do with. Uh, sometimes it has to do with actually inserting weaknesses or vulnerabilities into standards that we use every day. So of course, a huge example of this uh, that got a lot of publicity was uh, came out of the Snowden documents, um, and this is when it was discovered that uh, RSA and the NSA had a contract, um, and essentially the NSA was responsible for using having this weakened standard um, be the most commonly used standard in RSA products. And of course, RSA is a huge leader in the security industry. Um, so, uh, so usually when we say backdoors, we're talking about ba these sort of backdoors into products and services. Uh, there's also a um, loophole that allows the government to uh, access Americans' communications without a warrant, and that's uh, the Section 702 backdoor. So that's the other way you might hear that used. Uh, and the reason I mentioned both of them is because these are often discussed at the same time in Congress. Um, so domestic surveillance, uh, I'm not going to give much of a background on that. Um, I'll just say that the current state of play um, when it comes to mass surveillance by the NSA, which of course uh, was thrust into public light on June 5th, um, 20, oh my god, it was 2013. 2013. I, it's, that's, yeah, it's really, the, I had to pause we for a second. We have a lot since then. Yeah. <laughs> I had to pause for a second because it's been a very packed two years. Um, so, of course, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has been concerned about domestic surveillance for a long time, since before 2013. Uh, we were actually suing the NSA um, as early as 2008. We had a case against the NSA uh, based on a whistleblower from AT&T who discovered this secret room uh, at AT&T where he believed all of the uh, communications were being copied. So. Um, We've been suing them for a long time. Uh, we were very excited uh, after the leaks to see everybody get really upset about what was going on. Um, so uh, I'll just say um, that there, some legislation was passed when Section 215 of the Patriot Act came up for renewal. Um, we can talk about that if people have questions. I think we're mostly going to do Q&A, um, but uh, just to give you s some sort of fodder for questions, although I'll bet you all have some already. Um, so that's, that's a little bit scattered. I think I will leave it up to the rest of the panelists to sort of uh, mention what they think is, uh, you know, if you could just pick the top thing that you would like everybody to know uh, about domestic surveillance or about backdoors, um, maybe we could throw that out there and then open it up for questions. So uh, Blair, I'm going to put you on the spot again, starting right at my left. All right. Um, one of the handouts that I, I brought today, and I don't think I brought en uh, enough copies, but it's the ProPublica. Um, print out and if you don't uh, have a copy you can go to their website and search for it but basically 
what it is is a table of kind of the main programs that have been uh, revealed by the disclosures from Edward Snowden. And I'll just kind of give you a quick rundown of, of some of them. So, for example, there's something called egotistical goat and egotistical giraffe, which is basically um, a program that was uh, aimed at uh, defeating Tor, which is an online browsing uh, platform that uh, is supposed to keep you anonymous when you're on the Internet. So there are a lot of different other programs like uh, quantum theory, which is basically a system set up to intercept traffic and then insert packets that are malicious between uh, two points on a network. Uh, muscular, which was aimed at um, infiltrating the data centers and the data of Yahoo and Google. So with that particular program, uh, they couldn't do it legally within the United States, and so this muscular program moved out into the middle of the ocean where they tapped the fiber optic cables and got the information. So stuff like that, um, it's all in this, this, this printout. PRISM, which is collecting information from U.S. companies. Um, they've even uh, tested extracting people's personal information from the Angry Birds app. I've never played it, but apparently. <laughs> so, I mean, any possible way you can think that, uh, you know, for them to get data, they're working on it. And some of it's foreign, some of it's domestic. Uh, so I think that's an important distinction we're going to kind of talk about today. Um, there's the metadata collection, which is uh, foreign, but is also domestic. Uh, and recently, the USA Freedom Act was passed, which basically the NSA is no longer collecting this metadata or will no longer be collecting in the future. Uh, there's a sunset kind of situation going on with that law. Uh, but then the telecoms will, will actually be required to hold this data. So for all intents and purposes, there's very little change. Uh, that's that's probably the biggest change that's happened, but in the grand scheme of all these disclosures, it's relatively small, I think. So um, I would just encourage you to go to this website. They have a great summary, and the EFF has a lot of resources as well. Um, other organizations like Electronic Privacy Information Center and Access Now. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, I'll just pass it on. So I'll make three fairly quick mm -hmm. points. Um, the first one is that they're actually, before I do this, a really great resource for all of you if you're typing it in or taking notes. Um, Access held a crypto summit um, back in July. What we did is we brought all of the experts together and we have the videos from that. There was a summary of the crypto history. There's a panel on the technology of encryption, all those videos. We also created really huge graphics to map out the history of the crypto summit, and that's on accessnow.org slash events slash crypto summit. Um, very great if you are interested in cryptography. Um, so the three quick points I'm going to make, one is that there's lots of different types of encryption. Um, there's encryption that encrypts your, your traffic as it's flowing. There is the encryption that is encrypting your hard drive, and that is a different technology. Um, what we really like is the end-to-end -end encryption for traffic, where you have a key, the person you're sending something to has a key, and no, never between those two of you can that, unless um, you give that key out to somebody or your key is compromised, you can't really access that. Um, it's the opposite of when you're having a company transmit something for you and they can access your information on their servers. Um, it's really the strongest so long as you're good at protecting your key. Um, so we <coughs> encourage companies to encrypt their data but because of backdoors and because of the ways government interact with that data, sometimes there are ways for that to be undermined. Um, three quick ways for that is either some sort of backdoor, either a mandated backdoor, a judicially ordered backdoor, or a, some companies voluntarily put backdoors in their products. Um, and these allow company or allow governments and other actors to bypass the encryption and to go through a different way to get access to your data. And there's a lot of different ways those have been made available. The Washington Post likes to think that there can be some golden key um, that can provide only government access to your data. Technologists largely believe this is impossible and that once you have a backdoor built in, it's going to be pretty much accessible by anybody who can figure out where it is. Um, there is the idea that you can undermine encryption standards and provide yourself with a backdoor, um, which the NSA has been doing. There is a very small federal agency called the National Institute for Standards and Technologies that develops the standards on which encryption ends up being built. 
that agency is required to consult with the NSA as they develop those standards, mainly because the NSA is supposed to be the tech experts and they're supposed to provide technical expertise. Um, unfortunately, what the NSA does is what Edward Snowden has revealed is that they undermine the standards and they artificially weaken them in order to provide themselves access. They want to make sure that the standards are only so high so that they can still break into them and gain access to your communications. So that's another way backdoors can be formed. And then a third way, which isn't really backdoors, but it's government hacking. Governments going to your device or going to your um, phone, some way getting into the device and providing themselves access um, directly by somehow um, hardwiring their way in. And then my last point really quick is that it's not just the US doing this. Um, it's Russia, it's China. It's the UK, and I will talk about that in a little bit, and it's not just us. Um, in the US, there tends to be the idea that you know, we're, we're all out for each other, and the US should, people in the US should be protected. Um, but there are a lot of people, innocent people, all over the world who are really, really incredibly impacted by the idea that people can break into their communications. And sometimes it's a matter of life or death. So when we talk about crypto backdoors, it really impacts everybody around the world, and it's a problem that governments all over the world are trying to get in on. Um, the point I want to make is uh, kind of to build on Amy's. Um, it was either late last year or earlier this year where iOS and Android locked down their systems, or at least Google locked down their systems, and um, there was a huge upcry from the law enforcement agencies, uh, in particular. Uh, the FBI director went on record saying, um, you know, basically these companies are now uh, enabling pedophiles. So um, please be aware of that kind of thing simply because that's one of the first screams they get heard. It's like protect the, some group, and it's usually the kids because people have such a reaction to it. Whenever you hear that by default be suspicious of it, because certainly it, it does benefit them, but it's also very much a, um, an excuse for them, basically, because we really don't have, compared to the population, the necessity for backdoors to access those cases does not warrant or does not justify having backdoors to access everyone's device. So while there is definitely a need for that, anyone who's saying that is usually promoting an agenda. So when they, when they do ask things like that, question them on that. All right, what's the percentage? You know, is this the only way that you can possibly get this information? Um, and it's really the only way that they can do that. There are usually ways, um, other ways that they can build cases like that. Uh, and, and actually, just to add on to that, I, um, I kind of love this quote. Um, this is from a hearing on encryption that happened uh, just a couple of months ago. Um, and this is Senator John McCain. Uh, talking about why there needs to be a golden key uh, into encrypted communications. Um, I've heard my colleagues with all due respect talking about attacks on privacy and our constitutional rights, et cetera, et cetera, but it seems to me that our first obligation is the protection of our citizenry against attack, which you agree is growing. Um, so uh, I think uh, there was a lot of people who sort of found it concerning that he would sort of et cetera, et cetera, constitutional rights. Uh, <laughs> And, and this was in the context of hearings where uh, lawmakers were really trying to get numbers about how much of a problem encrypted communications are. Um, there are no numbers out there. There's uh, the only number that we got was from the Manhattan DA. I, I said this number earlier um, in a panel, so I apologize if you heard it before, saying that they had encountered, I think it was uh, 78 iPhones where encryption, where they couldn't break the encryption. They didn't even say exactly how they caused a problem. Um, so let me see if, if there are questions. If there are any questions, um, we, will, we can take questions. Otherwise, we can, oh, great. And we run out, then I will ask the panelists more things. Um, I'm hoping that someone can talk about the antecedents to domestic surveillance, because my understanding is that the Patriot Act was in play long before 9-11 happened. So there are historical you know, precedents to um, this, this, these large-scale domestic um, surveillance programs, and I'm hoping that, that some or, or any of you can talk about those, those antecedents. Um, yeah, there definitely were. For example, the FISA courts have been in, the, uh, in existence since the early 70s. Um, and basically, what, how many of you do not know what the FISA court is? Okay. All right, so what the FISA court is, it's this little, um, literally a single room sitting in an office building in, a, I think it's in DC, um, where the government can go and get a warrant to 
pretty much do whatever they want as far as tapping people's communications. And there was a provision in there that you could go ahead and establish a tap without a warrant and you get a warrant um, after the fact. Um, what the Patriot Act really did was it opened that up in a significant way. Um, it used to be that if you had something, you had to go get a FISA warrant. Very few people knew about those, that FISA court. Um, the Patriot Act really didn't establish as much as expand what was on the books and expand the, uh, the scope of what was there. And that was its, its major thing. It essentially established a standard where the government can get anything they want and they can try and justify it after the fact. Um, that's really its, its, its biggest issue, is, the, is that scope change that it brought to the table. Yeah, and it's called the, fi oh, go ahead. it's called the FISA Court, it's under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which was basically passed, I believe, 1978? Yes. Anyone correct? Uh, October 5th, 1978. Yeah, and uh, it was in response to the church committee hearings because there was a bunch of spying going on during the civil rights era. And when all that information came out, there was an uproar kind of similar to what's happening today. Um, and then that act was passed as a result. And then this court was basically established. Um, but as it turns out, as these court orders, the modern court orders are being released, um, they're being criticized because they're so broad. They just basically say all the records of everyone in the country. And so kind of what, what was initially supposed to prevent abuse of the surveillance powers is kind of uh, fostering it in a way. And so uh, part of the debate is you know, the procedures that are available in this court. Um, as it stands right now, there's only, only the government can present arguments. Um, it's in secret, it's not public. Uh, and so uh, pundits will say, you know, it doesn't really resemble a court at all. <laughs> and uh, so at any rate, and that's kind of the origin of it and uh, what has preceded this whole debate. And so a lot of the debate in Congress and elsewhere surrounds you know, the procedures available. Uh, some have argued for an advocate in the FISA or the FISC as it's called. Uh, for an intelligence surveillance court, you know, advocate for civil liberties uh, to actually get two sides of an argument. <laughs> so, yeah. So, a, f a few things that are really necessary if we're going to talk about the FISA court. One is that before 1978, there was no court. So, when government wanted to conduct surveillance, they said that they couldn't go to a public court to conduct surveillance because it was a matter of national security. So that's how we got a lot of secret programs. Um, the FISA court was in reaction to that. It was a way to have judicial oversight in a national security environment where there previously was no judicial oversight. So it was a great reform. It was actually something in the 1970s that was trumpeted as a really great reform. Um, and even to this day, in other countries, there isn't judicial oversight. In fact, in the UK, national security surveillance orders are approved by a magistrate, which is not separate from the branch that is requesting the surveillance. It's all within one branch. So at least the FISA court is in a separate branch of government. That is not to say it's great. And actually in the USA Freedom Act that just got passed last year, um, it was the first um, bill that passed through Congress since 1978 that actually restrained the NSA and the ability for them to conduct surveillance. It pulled that back and it created some new um, protections in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. It's still a secret court. In fact, if you try to get off the elevator in the U.S. District Courthouse where that court is, and I've tried this before, they will kindly escort you back onto the elevator and see you on your way. It is very secret. Um, however, they now have to publish their major opinions. Anything that is new, a new interpretation or a substantial interpretation has to be publicly made available um, to the greatest extent possible with a few redactions, but they're supposed to not redact much. Um, so that was actually a big win. So we'll know when things that are significant are coming out of the FISA court. And it did create uh, not an advocate per se, but a system for people who are not the government to be references for the court, either um, legal experts, constitutional experts, technologists, which is like in DC, that's just beyond the realm of thinking that a court would bring in a technologist so they would actually understand the technology and not just like have no idea what's going on in the world. Um, so they can actually bring these people in now and get advice on what this technology means and how it impacts people, which was really also a great thing. We would like to see these decisions made in public. We would like to see the FISA court be a public court. Um, we think that's you know necessary for public accountability. But in the global realm of things, where things are really bad in other places, this is actually fairly significant that we at least have a system 
um, and we're going to push for further reforms of that system. Um, but surveillance has been going on forever. If you're talking about, I mean, going back to the original question, um, we have moved, the problem is, is as surveillance gets cheaper and easier and more um, affordable for government, they tend to conduct more of it. And that has been the, the trend forever. Surveillance is cheaper, so let's do more. Let's sur surveil more people. And the internet is the great cheapener of surveillance because they can put a tap on a fiber and just collect all the unencrypted information that comes over that. And the encrypted information they also collect and they see that as a reason to store it forever. If they can't read it, then they can just keep it until they can. Actually, they do for five years. The NSA at least keeps it for five years simply for technology reasons in that they don't have enough disk space to store it for but longer they can. than that. Their, but their yeah. procedures allow them to keep it forever. Yeah. Um, and, the th and the thinking is that just because we can't crack it today doesn't mean we can't crack it tomorrow. Uh, so, so just a, uh, a couple of things to add. One, uh, so I'm not, uh, the history of FISA and the, and the ways it's been amended since it's passed, I'm not an expert, but I can say that uh, but even before the Patriot Act was passed, FISA had been amended several times and that um, sort of politically speaking that during the 90s there was definitely a move to looking at uh, certain political activities as domestic terrorism. So the, there was the anti terrorism and effective death penalty act that was passed um, and there was a, I think a little bit more I think there was a shift in the sort of national security culture um, that happened pre 9-11 um, and I think that's really all I needed to add and, and uh, the hand way in the back was first and then we'll uh, get up to the hand right here sorry I wish I knew everybody's names <coughs> then I'd be uh, the NSA um, it seems that um, someone has said uh, to quote them, surveillance is the business model of the internet, meaning that a lot of private organizations ha are accumulating an amazing amount of data about everything that we search in a search engine. Does it really matter who has the massive data, whether it's government or private, because it can be hacked and, and stolen by anyone, wherever it, it uh, resides? Yes. So the question is, does it make a difference if the government's got all the data or Google has all the data, if all the data exists and someone can, can, can break into it anyway? Yeah, absolutely. The difference there is what they have and what they can use. Um, for the government to make a case against someone, they have to be able to justify um, why they have this information and how they got it and how it's relevant. Um, like you're saying, anything can be hacked. The bad people don't really care. They're going to be trying to uh, blackmail you with it. They're generally using the information whatever way they can. I know with the, with the recent um, Ashley Madison hacked, um, people actually started getting emails saying, hey, you were on the site, we found your information online, um, pay us money or we're gonna start um, telling all your friends about it. Um, the government is obviously restrained from doing such a thing. So just because they have the information doesn't necessarily mean they can use it. So there are constraints, so there's very definitely a, um, an important consideration, at least when we're talking as far as uh, surveillance goes. Now that doesn't mean they can't use it in other ways. Um, for example, one of the big uh, issues that NSA had um, was they were sharing information with the um, DEA in something called parallel construction where they would be monitoring for terrorism, they'd come across someone arranging a drug deal internally uh, within the US, I mean, they'd pass that information on to the uh, DEA with a caveat that you never got this from us, you've never spoken to us about this, but be in such and such a corner at such and such a time because you're going to have something go down you want to know about and just make sure that you have a different reason or you have a legitimate reason for being there. So the government fortunately has to justify how and where it got the information from for the most part. Um, so it's, it does matter where they get that from and where it's kept. Uh, a few things to add and there have been a lot of other panels so I'm going to try to not repeat myself too much for what has been said earlier this weekend. The first is that there are companies out there who have fought tooth and nail against government surveillance. Um, they have tried to make it so that the government can't get access to their user information. Um, the, off the top of my head is Yahoo, which fought in the FISA court in secret for a very long time to try to protect their user data. So there, there is that divide as well. When the government has to request it from a company, the company can then fight against it judicially, and we encourage them to do that. Um, there's a matter of security. Um, somebody on a panel I was on earlier this week, and if it's anybody who's up here, I apologize um, for calling them out. 
but said that you know nobody is going to protect your data as well as you protect your data. But the problem is, unless you're a technologist and you know all of the ways that your data isn't secure on your own server, sometimes there are companies who may protect your data better than you can because you're going to do things that just are, are bad security practice without knowing it. So it is a matter of trust and making sure your data is as protected as possible. And maybe if it's very you know, sensitive, you do want to keep that yourself. But you do want to make sure it's also protected against criminals and bad guys um, as opposed to the government. So there's both concerns. And the final thing is, is just the collection itself. Gov when companies collect your data, they are enabling government surveillance. Even if they fight against it, even if they're protecting it from criminals, the government all governments all over the world can compel them in many instances to release that data. Um, and that's a problem. And one of the ways that we say that they should go about keeping that from being a problem is collecting as small amount of a data as possible. And we still encourage them to do that. Um, we also think that it's great when companies are enabling end-to-end -end -end encryption, which I talked about earlier, and companies like Yahoo and Google are starting to recognize this, and so both of them have talked about enabling end-to-end -end encrypted email, where they will no longer have the data in your email. They're going to give that back to you if you use this end-to-end -end service that they're talking about deploying, um, and we're expecting to see that within the next year. So they are trying to make sure it's secure for you and that you have access to it and take their own access away. Um, I want to add one thing to that as well to expand on that there um, by protecting your own data. How many of you uh, heard about the recent thing where CVS was not going to be doing Apple Pay? All right, so what happened was there's a new standard coming out for payments um, next month actually where the liability for who's responsible for fraud um, is shifting. And it's pretty much moving from the bank to not the bank. Um, and the general rule is whoever in the chain has the weakest security becomes liable uh, for, um, for the fraud to basically make it up to the consumer. And uh, one of the reasons that uh, the pharmacies were not accepting Apple Pay um, was because they were uh, they've still establishing their own little consortium of sharing information between themselves. So it's like Walmart and a couple others over there. They're looking to collect the data of how you shop, what you shop with, um, anytime you use a loyalty card, um, something along those lines, and then they share it between themselves. They, they will promise very happily they'll never sell your data, but they'll simply enter into a relationship with whoever they want to sell it to, and then they freely share their data with their business partners. So it may be fantastic that you're keeping all of your data safe on Google and Yahoo and whatnot, but it doesn't help when you're turning around and basically giving it away at CVS and Walgreens and uh, Walmart and stuff like that. So be very aware of that when you guys are using the uh, prescription drug, the, the RX discounts cards, when you're using um, loyalty cards. The reason they're offering you those benefits is because they're making a fortune selling your data on the back end. So just as a question, um, what would you want in sort of the future for um, laws for the government to have good encryption for users, but then also um, ideally what would you like the government to be allowed to access or not allowed to access? Like in your ideal world, like what would magically you'd want to have happen? Amy actually talked about this uh, on an earlier panel where uh, Europe has basically said your data belongs to you and anyone who's using it, essentially, um, they do not own that data, you own that data. Um, in my ideal world, it would be a case of, all right, if they want to sell your data, you get a cut of that. And at that point, you can then choose whether or not you want to you know, get some money from what they're doing with it or whether you're willing to um, you know, give up that money and basically they can do nothing. They've got to scrub everything to do with you from their list. So, so I think you were asking about uh, surveillance laws and access yeah. to encrypted data, right? Okay. Yeah, um, mostly about surveillance. Yeah. Like, so yeah. So I, um, I, I also hope Amy will will add to this. Um, but I, you know, I, I think there are some things that we have asked for over and over again in legislation that we would like to see. Um, 
So in terms of the FISA court, uh, I think this was mentioned, right, having a, an advocate for privacy in the FISA court. We have the amicus provision of USA Freedom, uh, seeing somebody who had even more power, um, had more independence, uh, seeing uh, the classification system needs to be fixed. I mean, this is a huge problem. Um, I guess, and I guess just fo narrow, more, but more narrowly focused specifically on, on encryption, I mean, we... EFF has a pretty clear position on that. Uh, we think encryption needs to be freely available and it should not ever, there should never be a backdoor. Um, I mean, we, there is no technologically feasible solution that would allow for a backdoor that uh, it's just not possible right now. And we've, we've had like the leading computer scientists all come to, or leading uh, security experts all come together to say this. I mean, they sent a letter to Congress to say this and this is the first time they've said anything together in this fashion since the, since the government was trying to push the clipper chip. So um, technologically, it is not feasible in a way that will not make everybody else less safe. So that can't be the solution. So, so, so the solution needs to be the judicial process in the way that it has been for a very long time in this country. Uh, you know, we, uh, I think one of the best uh, quotes that I heard about trying to make any kind of encryption illegal and trying to create some sort of special backdoor, it, it was, uh, I think this was in Medium, it was the let's make curtains illegal article, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, I mean, we have to accept as a society if we still believe in the Constitution and we still believe in the in the idea that letting guilty people go free in order to have privacy for other people, uh, to have rights for other people, uh, I think we need to agree that that's the case here too. Um, and what we're seeing is government essentially trying to say that they don't believe that anymore, um, but that you know they don't want to come out and say it, other than kind of John McCain. Um, I think mm. you probably have a more constructive thing to say than me. So there's, there's a, a document called, and this is a mouthful, I apologize, um, the International Principles on the Application of Human Rights to Communication Surveillance. Um, also called the Necessary and Proportionate Principles, and <coughs> conveniently at necessaryandproportionate.org. Um, and those are 13 principles that are supposed to, in a human rights respecting world, guide what surveillance law and policy looks like. And actually, I recently um, had the tremendous opportunity, um, and by recently I mean over the last year and a half plus, to write a document that is like in an ideal world, which is what you asked, this is what this is the implementation guide for the principles this is what we think surveillance law policy and procedure should look like in the most ideal world possible um one of those things was there should be no bulk surveillance um everybody there is no way that everybody is involved in a crime surveillance should be targeted it should be looking at the individuals that they're going to get criminal information from there should be no back doors um, it's a very long document, but there's a really um, great executive summary at the beginning that basically talks about here is the ideal world and what we are pushing for um, and why we're pushing in that direction. But then it goes through the entire, instead of, it goes through a step-by-step -step process from conceiving that you want to conduct surveillance as a government agent through the process of either requesting that information internationally, judicial review, um, it, it is that process instead of the, the principles process of saying this is what the whole process should look like and so we have done that whole ideal ideal world scenario um, and published something that we think is that piece thank you I guess one thing I would just add real quick would be there are basically national security letters and companies are are prohibited from disclosing the existence of it so not only does the user not even have an a ability to challenge it they don't even know it exists so they they don't even know it exists so they, they can challenge it so that's a huge <coughs> huge thing and there are a lot of those that go out uh you know and other types of process basically that are basically gag orders attached to them so i mean i think that that you know i think there's a time and place for for those but i think it needs to be severely limited right, right now they're just the volume of those types of subpoenas and process going out is, is very large and uh, it's very flimsy as far as, you know, it just requires a certification or something signed by, you know, a bureaucrat, a high-ranking bureaucrat, uh, and that's it. And then, you know, it's extremely hard to finally find out about it. A couple people have, and uh, uh, people have argued that it even prohibits a person who receives it from speaking with an attorney. So it's, it's a huge problem. Uh, it kind of goes along with the classification. And uh, I think there needs to be more processes set up, even if they are restricted or sealed or whatever. Um, so. I don't know what order people raise their hands in, so you're just gonna have to pick. 
So I think the EU came out with a great document a while back about they were looking into building ne their own nest, right? They were they say what is going to be the undertaking for building our own encryption standards body instead of relying on what comes out of the U.S. And the TLDR version was it's going to take a lot of people, and we just want to make an open. They don't believe the right the government should own a math equation. Mm -hmm. So it's what open standards body is now being formed to handle that? Is, is that I'm probably lacking some knowledge on. I just want to know where mm -hmm. that's going because they recognize it and says we're not going to build our own NIST. Yeah. Let's make it open. Um, I'm not. I the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> um, I will say one of the things that we are trying to do um, legislatively is divorce NIST from the NSA. Right. Make it so that they no longer have to consult with the NSA on standards give it a permissive standard, very little known. NSA has two missions. One is signals intelligence, that's surveillance. One is information assurance, which is protecting. It is making sure that NIST is only consulting with the NSA in furtherance of information assurance and not signals intelligence. Um, so we're trying to do that legislatively. We're also trying to get them more resources, and it's so hard. Um, they, their, their funding bill this year, they try, or last this year, they tried to cut out their funding to pre-2014 levels and give extra funding to the FBI to hack into computers. <laughs> it was it was ridiculous. It wasn't even like they requested more money than they, for 2016 than they had received in 2015. And instead of giving them more money, they gave them significantly less to develop standards and to evolve as an agency that should be independent and should have its own technologists. Instead, they really decided that the money should be going to the FBI so that they could make everybody in this room and around the country and around the world uh, just a little bit less secure. Um, and we, we fought against that. And actually, we got their, their funding um, re-upped. So they will be funded at 2016 levels, which is great. Um, the FBI, unfortunately, is also getting that money. So is, is the divorce still happening between the two at some point, or is that still a work in progress? It's still a work in progress. We've had a lot of amendments introduced on this. They all, every time an amendment that I know of on this subject has been introduced, it's passed. Um, it's a matter of getting it past both houses of Congress at the same time in the same bill, um, and that has not yet happened. But there are people who are working on this. One of them, I don't, is anybody here from Florida? Yeah, Representative Grayson from Florida has championed this topic um, and has been fairly good on it, and so he's still fighting for it. Like Blair said, there definitely is a need for some government security because be there are criminals out there. Um, I think the biggest problem there is that the government has abused the powers that they have had in the past. And um, our pretty much reaction is that, well, you guys essentially screwed the pooch with the trust that we did give you, therefore we're not going to trust you with anything. If you guys actually had used this responsibly from the get-go, it would be a whole different matter. But right now there's no way we can trust you because you have been repeatedly caught and you have repeatedly demonstrated that we can't trust you with this because you try and expand it way beyond um, both what we're comfortable with and with what the physical letter of the law says. And on a, I don't know that the government will be able to get that trust back again um, without essentially resetting the whole thing. And I just don't think that's going to happen. Well, it's very hard to get that trust back. Uh, here's a quote from President Obama. So August 6, 2013, says, We don't have a domestic spying program. There is no spying on Americans. <laughs> <laughs> so you can look at the stuff online and you can evaluate whether that's a truthful statement or not. NIST is developing a document. We've commented on it. They've actually gone through two, mostly federal agency publishes a document, you provide comments, and then they publish a final version. Here they published a document on how they were going to do standards. We provided very long comments. Mm -hmm. Then they published another draft, and they were like, actually, we want more comments. So then we provided another round of comments. We're still waiting on the final version, but they're trying to get a document that will guide their standard setting process that will try to move toward getting that trust back. But the people I know in the agency recognize that there is a big deficit there. Uh, I had a quick question regarding, not quick, but a question regarding uh, just what's going on with the data scrubbing. Uh, G Jeff uh, mentioned specifically, you know, in his ideal world, you'd be able to opt out of this uh, data collection essentially without taking a cut. And I know that I had read, uh, I guess, somewhere in some Euro court that it had been decided that uh, a citizen could uh, contact Google to have uh, search information scrubbed. Correct. So is there any sort of 
push being made to, uh, I guess, for a more of a larger sweep anywhere, like in any any uh, different zone or legal system where you could possibly scrub any movement? No. Uh, um, e even in the even in the Europe case, it was limited to Google. Google's the only one who was actually required by law to do that. Now, um, as they changed, well, initially they were. Other companies then started doing it because they could see where this was going. Um, now, I don't know if apparently the law has been expanded to include others as well. Um, but initially, it was, it was very specific to Google only um, based on that. Um, and I don't think anything like that's made it as far as um, being anywhere close to implementation on the US side. Um, thanks to the NSLs and stuff, a lot of times you can't even get the information that you, that, you know, that someone searched for you, um, essentially, as far as that goes. Um, and I think we are going to have a problem getting so anything similar to that being passed simply because of the whole, you know, think of the children type argument that any time someone mentions that, sort of that's the fallback point and you wind up looking like a jerk because, you know, I want my data to be safe and therefore I'm promoting pedophilia. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're going to have a, a tough time with that. Yeah, it's recently with the uh, right to be forgotten stuff, there's actually been... Uh one of the sites I, I sometimes contribute to Tech Dirt, they actually got a request uh, just a week or two ago requesting an art article to be removed about them writing about it, an article that was removed. So yep. it was actually becoming a, a meta thing in effect mm -hmm. because it was like the original request they were, that reporting on the thing removed is now being removed. So, it, so they wrote another piece. So the original has been removed, the thing about it has been removed, and now there's a third piece you have to follow three links in the chain to even find it now so it's becoming a a big problem with uh, being removed just trying to people just trying to hide things that in this case it was a criminal conviction that was being uh, he wanted it hidden so it wouldn't be done he was even trying to be using copyright law to get it done see I'll be willing to bet though if anything like that did pass in the US um, wanted to be against a whole lot of opposition and as soon as it, if it did ever pass you'd have agencies doing the same thing like anyone who complained about them, they'd say, all right, we're filing a request for you to take that down based on the following. Um, and then we'd have a whole new battle to go and fight with there, where it's like, well, no, those are public records. You can't do that. And First Amendment as well. Yeah. yeah. So the right to be, for those who don't know about the right to be forgotten, it is the ability for you to go and request that search results about you be removed. Um, this is now in the EU. Um, members of the EU government, one of the bodies has requested that Google also extend that protection to other people outside of the EU, which Google has politely said, no, thank you. Um, there is in the United States a great deal of tension between free speech and privacy, which is why that hasn't really taken off here just yet. Um, in the EU, it is much more of a privacy focused society. Um, and so just to, so that was France and just to, uh, clarify it's that um, so the right to be forgotten now if I go to google.co.uk right that uh, the right to be forgotten within the UK means that those requests can be uh, within the EU um, that those those requests can be taken down in the, on those sites um, only where the right to be forgotten is applicable and uh, Google said no to making that uh, so if I were to google.com right in the states um, they wanted that to be global so this is what Google said no to Okay, I guess my parting thought on that would be, um, I guess uh, the data I would be specifically referring to wouldn't necessarily be in the public eye. So it would be your personal data that's being, you know, thrown around. And as uh, Jeff said, it's mainly hidden. But yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know that uh, as far as domestic surveillance, you know, obviously since you're judicially going after some of these groups and corporations and government, you find out a lot of things through discovery process, right? Maybe. Uh, one of the things that I'm curious about is, uh, and some of us couldn't be at all the panels, but I am curious about this. Uh, did anybody touch on this weekend about all the elect uh, internet connected appliances this weekend? <laughs> a lot of us has heard, have heard things about the Xbox and, you know, about cable boxes and the mm -hmm. new internet control refrigerators, you know. In other words, as a consumer, our are we going to be looking at situations like the Xbox when it comes to smart devices within the home? So Jeff and I and Kit Walsh from EFF were on a panel at 10 a.m. this morning, which you all probably slept through, which I'm a little <laughs> bit jealous of, um, talking about the Internet of Things and security. Um, and so the, the long and short of it was that they're not really talking about security yet. 
um, companies making Internet of Things devices. Um, I will, Jeff, do you want to add a TLDR about that panel? Um, <laughs> sure. Basically, it, it, it came down to that it's not going to happen if something bad happens because both companies and Congress tend to be reactive more than proactive. Um, and essentially, we're going to have two fights. One is to get it established. And then two, once they overreach in the establishment after something bad happening, we have to then fight the next battle to get it cut down to where it should have been in the first place. Thank you. So they didn't back to people. I'm a registered nurse, and as the government is taking over health care and collecting all this data, I'm stunned how much data they're collecting. And then I found out 35 governmental agencies have access to all of our health information once they figure out all this internet stuff. So I have great concerns not only for myself but the patient and mm -hmm. everyone about it. It seems like it's going to be a free for all with all that data that they're collecting. And it's not just health information, it's other stuff too. Mm -hmm. And so the U.S. has a sectoral approach to privacy as opposed to the EU. The EU has general privacy laws. The U.S. is like, here's your credit privacy and here's your health privacy and health actually has a privacy law and still that is the environment that's happening so imagine the unregulated industries where your information is kind of flowing back and forth um that that is one of the problems we um post 9 11 they identified that government agencies needed to communicate with themselves more and that information needed to be shared more um, we would like to see some more accountability on where that information is going and specifically with Internet of Things connected medical devices to tie a lot of different things in together, yeah. which bleed a lot of the most sensitive data, that absolutely needs to be protected um, through encryption, through data security, and through making sure it's only going to the doctors or nurses that it needs to go to and isn't bleeding out into the They're world. They're collecting information about social things and other things that are not necessarily what I have ever learned as far as care stuff is. So they're going to know things about you mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily healthcare related. Oh yeah. I mean even with that I know HIPAA has got a number of, um, HIPAA is the uh, law that covers healthcare. Um, there are a lot of um, conflicting sections within that. Mm -hmm. So it's almost impossible for someone to actually comply with HIPAA because of those conflicting controls between there. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it, a lot of it goes back to what they can get and what they can use. Um, but unfortunately, especially on the malicious side, um, what can be used against you is usually significantly greater than what can be legally used against you. My, my question, comment kind of segues exactly on what she was just mentioning. There's been a legislative move to make more and more of your information public and to declare it public, especially with the finance campaign laws. And so people are getting more and more information. Like, for example, in that particular piece of legislation, you have to report if somebody's retired or their occupation. I think there's a there's a growing connection between the private sector and government as well. Like, kind of, maybe yeah. think of that. Like, there's CISPA, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing Protection Act, which is still being battled out, and there have been multiple uh, iterations of it. Basically, one of the controversial provisions of it is, is saying that private companies have a duty or, or at least can uh, give information to the government whenever they think some sort of criminal behavior is going on or something that affects national security. You look at the different versions of the legislation, you'll see different definitions of when they can or can't do this. But there's definitely a push in, in, uh, in a way to create legislation where it fosters a really close relationship between private companies just handing over information to the federal government and uh, that kind of thing, so. Okay, um, my question is <clears throat> kind of weird. When the government has information, you want it and you're looking for things like exploratory evidence <coughs> where like maybe a DA or a prosecutor is withholding the information from you, are there any like, okay, they have the right through the Fisk courts and FISA to go through our data and get warrants on us. Is there any way we can search their data? You just missed it. Oh. The, the Freedom of Information Act explained right before this. 
Oh, okay. okay. Uh, now that now that <laughs> being said, um, well, don't kill a dead horse. You already talked about. It. I missed that one. Yeah. <laughs> now that being said, uh, there are a lot of resources out there um, on on how to do your own Freedom of Information Act or how to do your own Public Records Act request if you're looking for information on a state level government agency that would be your your state law if you want to do it federal that's FOIA um, and and I actually strongly recommend if you've ever been involved in any sort of political activity or if you have any reason whatsoever to think that you might have an FBI file um, that's a really good way to get started doing FOIA requests um, they actually they you can fill something out online and it's it's pretty easy to do um, and it will give you an idea of what sort of document you know what sort of res responses you're gonna get what sort of documents you're gonna see um, also, if you uh, go to EFF.org slash NSA, um, that will give you the complete NSA timeline. Um, it's about a month behind, which is my fault because I'm the person who maintains it now. <laughs> um, but uh, but it'll it we have links to all the original Snowden documents um, on a time and, and we have a timeline just explaining when all the leaks came out. And that's another I think looking at those documents, um, there is more in there than anybody could really imagine. Like there there's there's some out there. Uh, the other thing is if you ever have the opportunity to support more w blo uh, protections for whistleblowers, absolutely do that um, because of course Snowden was a whistleblower, Manning was a whistleblower, you know, it's whistleblowers that um, people who put their own lives in danger um, and, we, you know, and we've seen what happens to them when they are prosecuted um, who allow us to know exactly what is going on. So they're incredibly important um, and they don't have enough protections. And I'm going to channel Nadia a little bit and put on my Nadia hat. Um, there are a lot of ways that local law enforcement um, are starting to collect more information about you. And they're actually, in some cases, like body cameras, developing policies about how that information is going to be used. Um, one of the things that you really want to make sure it can be used for is that you can access your own, like if there's videos that you are in, that you can access those videos and that they can be used not only to protect officers, but also as exculpatory evidence um, when they show that the person who has been picked up or arrested or whatever has happened hasn't done anything wrong. So you want to make sure that they can be used in both directions. Um, actually, if you go to EFF.org slash DragonCon FOIA, that's actually a link that um, Dave Moss from the EFF set up during the last panel. Um, and you'll actually see some requests that he filed during the last panel. Um, and there was a couple different places they went to. Uh, there are a number of police departments that were queried. And there was also another one for the um, Idaho National Laboratory, which was uh, nuclear waste management, was the request for that one. So EFF.org slash DragonCon FOIA. Yeah, and actually that, that will lead you to muckrock.com, um, which is a, a company that will do requests for you if you can't do them yourself. Uh, and they charge a pretty small fee, so uh, that's another option. Um, but I love that Dave set that link up. I just went and looked at, looked at it. Check it out. I, I'd like to follow up on my question, maybe more of a statement, and then I would like you to please react to the statement, which is that it doesn't matter who has the data. If the data exists, it belongs to whoever can decrypt and hack it. it. Basically, it's up for grabs, whoever has the data. So it doesn't matter if the government has it or Google has it or someone who's, who was uh, spilling my, my toaster in the Internet of Things. If it exists anywhere, it belongs to the best hacker and the best decryptor. It's basically almost public anyway. So please react to that statement. I mean, the best hacker and the best decryptor are not public. I don't think that those two are equate to one another. Well, um, docs, for example. I mean, once they get the once they get the information, if they want to do doxing, you can put it in a place where it belongs to everyone. So it's potentially public. Well, the difference between it being accessible to everyone and belonging to everyone um, that's actually where the laws are very useful because let's say they do publish it somewhere um, that it becomes available to everyone. That doesn't mean everyone owns it because you could still go sue them for libel or slander depending on how it's used. Um, so it, it goes back to what what people have versus what they can use against you. So, so I also think that uh, 
not to, I don't want to sound confrontational, but I think you have a fundamental misunderstanding of the use of data, right? So I have talked in every panel I've been on now about threat modeling. Um, so threat modeling is asking yourself questions about your data and uh, wh what you want to protect and who you want to protect it from. Uh, so you're thinking about why people would want to access your data. And the point I'm making is that the government and companies have very different motivations. Uh, companies want to make money. They want to make money in whatever way they can make money. And they want to make money in the easiest way. So sometimes that means that they're going to comply with government requests. Um, hackers have different motivations. I uh, have been targeted for hackers because of comments about feminism that they didn't like. Um, they're really, really bad hackers, so they didn't do very well. Um, you know, uh, but that, but, so you, you, know, you mentioned doxing, right? They, uh, they went and tried to find public information and, and put it up. Um, and they've, they've tried to do other things. Uh, they have a very different motivation from, for instance, uh, the United States government. Uh, they have a very different motivation from Facebook. And the point I'm making is, yes, if you actually were to combine all the data that was out there about you, um, there would be a complete picture. It would be a nightmare. Um, but that data is not available to everybody at all times. Not all hackers. Hashtag not all hackers. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I'm joking, yes, but I'm also being... Hackers. <laughs> I'm joking, but I'm also being serious that it still does matter. The laws that are in place still matter. Um, the different security at different companies that are holding your data matters. Uh, the different capabilities of different people who would want to access your data matter. All of those things matter. It does matter. It does matter what the government is doing because they don't have access to all those things. It does matter what security there is in place because not every hacker can get into every system. Um, it, we are not in some sort of post-apocalyptic data nightmare where everybody knows everything and everything is accessible all the time. So don't worry, we're not there yet. <laughs> now we'll say one thing, there is an argument actually in, in favor of that, just take the other side of the, um, the argument. Um, Iceland actually has a uh, rule where their version of the social security is not, is um, actually public. You can look up anyone's social security number. Um, the way they sort of get around that is that you have a picture ID which, which is also tied to that. So pretty much anyone, if you walk into a store and ask for your social security number, you can give it to them because it actually benefits you because they can simply do a quick search and see, is the person who's in front of me the same person that the government has on record? Now obviously we've got a much more um, insulated society, but when used appropriately, there is an argument for the other side because right now in the US, if someone's got your social security number, they can do all kinds of bad things against you where that becomes much, much harder in, com in uh, countries like Iceland, simply because anyone can go query their database and see whether or not this person is the person who's actually you know, making a request or standing in front of me. Uh. Um, I'm just curious if you know if there's any particular program or the government allows surveillance of military families. Uh, so I do know that military families, if you are living on a base, um, there are different laws that apply. I don't know exactly how that, um, specifically how that uh, affects surveillance. Um, I think I could find the answer, but I don't know it off the top of my head, and I don't want to give you incorrect okay. information. Okay, um, because my son was actually um, promoted, whatever, to a special forces unit, and he told me that they sat down and went through all of our Facebook pages with him and things were deleted and I've noticed I'll, I'll go into certain things in my internet accounts and things will be gone. Uh, some of that and could be. Also, um, I'll be having phone conversations and I'll hear clicks and weird, I may just be paranoid, but it's only been since my son was put into special forces. I had my, when I was discharged from the military, I shipped a huge box back to my uh, parents' house and when it got there, there were cables unplugged within my computer. So essentially they had gone through and scanned everything on my computer. So um, it happens, but I would be, I'd be willing to follow up with you legally and, and look into that actually, because that's an interesting, sure. sure but, um, and um, also my son was, my son was told too, you know, that military families are being targeted by ISIS. Like I could mm -hmm. even put, stickers on my car like army mom or anything like that or anything with his unit in particular um, which kind of sucks because I'm proud of him. Well th there is a good and a bad thing to that. I've got a brother who's in the military uh, as well <clears throat> and um, 
especially in cases where they do go into very sensitive areas like special forces, things like that, you really want to downplay your involvement there, specifically because... Um, yeah, I understand. I understand I, it's for our protection. Right, no, no, well, it's not just that. I know with SEAL Team 6, they, their families did actually get um, threats and things um, for those who had been sort of outed as being members of that um, after um, they took down bin Laden. Um, so yeah, I don't know how big of a threat that it is, but it is absolutely an active and, and viable threat. Um, and they do go through and scrub because there's been more than one, and not even special forces, just regular military folk who've um, posted uh, deployment information or um, other information they really should not have, um, similar to what Geraldo did when, before he got kicked out of being embedded. Um, perfectly innocently, but it's information that is absolutely useful to people who are against our interests. So mm -hmm. that, does, that is an act of concern. Yeah, if you want to give me your information after, I can try okay. and find an answer for you, actually. So. Well, you mentioned SEAL Team 6. Actually, my son is the unit that flies them around. Thank you. Contractors, too, sometimes in the work. My dad did two years over there. He had external hard drives that were sent back that were disassembled, and they came to me. And they had stickers on there that said, you know, this has been inspected. <laughs> Not like, Ooh. There was no stickers on my stuff, just... <laughs> so, um, so, the, so the one other um, just practical thing I would say is um, that if you're concerned about your any of your sort of social media settings or you want different ways to communicate, um, you can check out surveillance self-defense. It's uh, I, I, we did a panel on it yesterday on on using encrypted email and things like that. You don't have to uh, be a computer expert. Um, some of it is just tips for your own privacy. Just go to ssd.eff.org. Um, and I can write that down for you afterwards. But I think following up with Blair would be a really good idea. Um, I think this is our last question that we can take, and I know there were others. I'm really sorry, but whoever has the has the mic, go. It's I'll try to keep it really quick so you guys can talk some more. Um, back to medical stuff that she was talking about. Um, one of the things is it just seems like there's so much more medical data and non-medical data being forced to be. You know, I'm a, I'm a doctor, and I'm I'm being asked to gather data on my patients. That really creeps me out. Um, and what I'm being asked to do with the data really creeps me out. And then when I try to go access medical care and not participate in that data, I find that it's really hard to get medical care. Um, and I don't find that HIPAA and the High Tech Act are helping patients and patient care, and it's all done in the matter of saving money or quality. Like, any comments on that? And I'd love to hear what the European aspect is of protecting that medical data, because we talk about surveillance of our finances, but surveillance of our medical data and, and access to that, you know, the power in that is just mm -hmm. very scary. So I don't work, there is a whole body of law specifically on uh, health privacy. My, my very short reaction is actually Dr. Deborah Peel runs patient privacy rights out of Austin, Texas. It's, she's amazing, the organization is amazing. On this specific issue, you're not going to find a better resource. Um, and I would follow up with her directly, and she'll probably Dr. reach. Dr. Deborah Peel with Patient Privacy Rights. And she runs an annual conference in Washington, D.C., specifically on health privacy. And, and if you're in the medical profession, I think you, there, there's m more of a need for, for more people um, yeah, uh, to get involved. So definitely check that out. Excuse me, can I say something real quick? My name is Daniel Karpov, and I'm here to say God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was recorded. <laughs> Good job. Uh, yeah, I think I think we do have to wrap up. <laughs> well, yeah, he might done. have just wanted to get it on on the recording for the NSA, um, so they can review it later. I mean, I'm 100% certain that's why I just did that. I, that's, I, I also love the USA. Ditto. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I apologize for anybody who didn't uh, get to ask questions. I know some of us have flights to catch, so we do have to wrap up on time. Um, but thank you so much for coming. Thank you.